We all know that when you place a wooden splint into a flame, it catches fire. Easy. Anyone can do it. The wooden splint is a light. But now, if we take a larger piece of wood, for instance, a bit of a broom handle, and put that into a flame, we know it won't catch fire. So if I put this in, etc., and hold it there, nothing happening. It's not catching fire. Now, why is that? Perhaps you may know the answer, perhaps you may not know the answer, but it's a larger piece of material, that's one reason. But then we can take another larger material, and here I have something called a fire lighter, and we could say, well, let's try this larger piece of material and see what happens when we put this into a candle flame. And you notice it immediately catches fire and starts to burn. So why didn't the wood start to do this, but why did the fire lighter start to do this? Well, I'm going to first of all put this out by chucking it into a beaker of water, like that, you see. Oh, we're going to, there we are, that's just gone out there. But what I'm going to tell you now is that when you are burning wood, you are not actually burning wood, you are burning something completely different. And that is the topic that I'm going to be demonstrating for you during the next few minutes in this short demonstration on wood burning. So, as you know, when you put wood into a flame, it chars. And we could see the charring on this. It's gone black around the edges. That may be also due, incidentally, to, to a smoky flame. But the point is, it certainly isn't catching fire. And you will also know that if you hold it in the flame for long enough, of course, it will eventually start to burn. When wood burns, there are actually two processes occurring, and I'm going to demonstrate them in a short space of time. In this flask here, this is a retort flask, I have some wood, uh, I have basically wood shavings or sawdust. I'm going to just hold it up there. The flask is a little bit dirty from previous experiments, but you can see the sawdust, light brown colour, and it's moving around. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to roast the sawdust with a Bunsen flame at a fairly high temperature and I'm going to show you what happens. Now, when I do this, I shall be wearing safety specs. There is a small chance that the flask may crack or even explode. Now, I'm heating it with a Bunsen burner. Obviously, we have a limited amount of time, so we want to make sure that we can get this to you uh, as quickly as possible. As you see, initially, nothing is happening. But this is the point I want to make. Inside our retort flask, there is a limited amount of air. Air is necessary for burning. We know that. And so, there is a limit to how much of this sawdust can actually catch fire when it's inside this flask. Now, as you notice, some yellow smoke is beginning to appear. The sawdust is beginning to give off something, and what it actually is, what is the process which is actually taking place at the moment is we are chemically breaking down the sawdust into simpler substances. So if we're breaking down sawdust into simpler substances, it would be appropriate to say, well, what is sawdust in the first place in any case? Well, the answer is, it is by and large a natural polymer called cellulose. So it's mainly one substance, cellular, and it's a polymeric substance. It's made up of lots of carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, and oxygen atoms. And as I'm heating up this sawdust here, you can now see that the yellow fumes are beginning to develop inside. This is a smoke. I can also tell you it's beginning to smell pretty foul. And I hope you could see here, there are some droplets of a liquid beginning to condense on the inside of our, of our delivery tube, which we have here. Now, I am going to carry on heating this. I'm going to carry on heating this. You can see the smoke is coming out. And I hope you can also see that we now have a distillate coming out. Now, this is the remarkable thing. There is a liquid coming out from the wood, which is breaking down into simpler substances. I will now also tell you, you will not be surprised to know, 
that when the sawdust is being heated, it is obviously going to give off gases which catch fire. And I hope to show this to you in a few seconds. I will just try and put a light to it now. I don't think it'll catch fire, but just to show you. But there is certainly some steam being produced, and there is certainly a distillate, which is a liquid being produced. So if I put a light to it now, you'll see, oh, we already have a flame. We already have a flame. Now that flame is remarkable. It's like burning a piece of wood, but at a distance. Here I'm burning the wood directly. Is this flame the same as this flame? Yes, exactly the same flame, because I'm burning the same substance. Only the source of heat here is further away. Now what I'm going to tell you is that this flame which I'm burning here is a mixture of flammable gases. Think for a second what that mixture might involve. But I'll tell you the most surprising thing of all, even though this mixture of gases is burning, it's actually mainly carbon dioxide. Over 50% of these gases are carbon dioxide. The other main component is carbon monoxide, CO. And I have asked Dr. Owusu to come and assist me and to demonstrate. So if you could kindly, I'm going to introduce Dr. Owusu is helping me in today's demonstration in order, please get cracking on it, dear sir. Thank you very much. Do, I'm just telling you, Dr. Owusu is kindly helping me today in today's demonstration just to make sure that things move a little bit faster from one experiment to another and we can show you everything. So the gas, the main combustible gas that's produced when we decompose wood by the action of heat. By the way, this is called pyrolysis, the breaking down of a substance by the action of heat. And I'm just going to move my candle over here to, in order that um, uh, the Dr. Owusu can set fire to carbon monoxide. Now this is pure carbon monoxide, which incidentally you know, and look at that beautiful blue flame. Could you please move it to the front now, dear sir, just very carefully to the front. I'll take the candle away. We have we have many hands on deck here, and then swirl it around a little bit so that everyone can see this magnificent flame. Now, what is happening? That is the main combustible, yes, put it on, the, put it down, that's it, that's it. The main combustible gas in here then is, uh, in the wood is carbon monoxide, which as you know is very toxic. It's a highly toxic gas, you can't see it, you can't smell it, and yet it's very, very deadly. Now fortunately, there is no carbon monoxide escaping because it's all being burnt. And there you see, and what does carbon monoxide produce when it burns? Obviously, carbon dioxide. So this is an entirely harmless experiment. By the way, I'll just tell you what the ingredients were. Sodium formate is what is used in the, in the preparation of carbon monoxide. And the other ingredient, the liquid, concentrated sulfuric acid. We're not going to go into the details of that today, but I think no one will dispute the fact that this is a very beautiful reaction. Crazy, could we kindly now extinguish it? And the way we extinguish this flame in a safe way, because you don't want to blow the flame out and allow carbon monoxide to come out and possibly um, intoxicate you, the way we blow it out in a safe way is to pour water in. Now, as you pour water into that mixture, you'll notice the flame rises. Furthermore, that it's rising because the water is displacing carbon monoxide, and as the carbon monoxide is displaced, it comes out and burns. Notice also the, yeah, the orange color of the flame. I don't know whether you can guess why the flame has gone from blue to orange now. The explanation is very simple, but I'm not going to tell you today. All I'll give you is a hint. The substances used to make were sodium formate and concentrated sulfuric acids. Why did the flame turn orange? You should be able to know. If you don't, then find out from your chemistry teachers. Now, while this is continuing to go here, I am going to ask Dr. Owusu to, um, to initiate the next experiment, which is to show you another combustion. 
and this will concern one of the liquids which is produced during this. So, if I can ask you, uh, dear sir, to um, set this up and take your time, there's no need to hurry. The reason, by the way, why we're doing this for quite a little while is I'm quite keen to show you what these products are, what the liquid is there. Let's return to the gas. The main gas produced in the pyrolysis of wood, which is what's going on here, is carbon dioxide. That is about slightly over 50%, but the, in, the flammable gas is carbon monoxide, which you just saw burning there. What other gases are produced? There are several of them, of which the next one in order is hydrogen, about between 1% and 2%, and small amounts of hydrocarbons, such as methane, propane, butane, etc. And this mixture is now burning off. I am now going to remove my source of heat by turning off my Bunsen burner, and obviously the flame will, in a second, in a few seconds, go out indeed. Uh, please, dear sir, carry on. I wanted to tell you that this mixture here, now what Dr. Owusu is going to now do is to ignite for you one of the products in the liquid here. There are three products produced which are also flammable in the liquid and some of which incidentally have come off as a vapour. And they are the liquids propanone, otherwise known as acetone, which Dr. Owusu has just poured onto our lid there. They are methanol, which is an example of an alcohol. Please set fire to it, sir. I'll carry on talking. So this is one of the products which I have in this beaker here. It is acetone, otherwise known as propylone, and watch this flame burn. I'll just explain what we've got in here. There were 20 centimetres cubed of propylone were put in there, and this is a steel trough. And as Dr. Owusu lit it, you will notice a blue flame will have shot down the, the, um, the, the, the steel trough, and gradually the flame will get bigger and bigger. And why is the flame getting bigger and bigger? Because propanone is a very volatile liquid. CH3, CO, CH3. That's the chemical formula. I'll explain to you a little bit about these organic compounds that come off from the pyrolysis of wood, and I've got some of them here. And I will tell you a little bit more about them. So propanone is that one there, which is produced in this destructive distillation. By the way, it's called, this process is called also, in addition to pyrolysis, we call it destructive distillation. The reason why we call it destructive distillation, well, because you're literally destroying the molecules. And we have, as a product here, this liquid, which, as I said, will have contained some acetone, propylone, but it will also contain mainly two other ingredients. And those two ingredients are ethanoic acid and methanol. And I will tell you a little bit about more about these later on. Basically, we have produced three liquids from three different families of organic chemicals. Organic chemistry is the study of chemistry of substances found in living things. And though this was a branch of chemistry which developed significantly during the middle of the 19th century, and it was the German chemists who were particularly good at this. About, about from, they separated using fractional distillation and other techniques, they separated the products of various processes involving living things, and then, importantly, they were able to classify them into various families. So, ethanoic acid, which is one of the products in here, as I hope to show you shortly, is an example of what we call a carboxylic acid, RCOOH. That's the general formula. We have here methanol, otherwise known, by the way, as wood alcohol. Both of these have been extensively, for hundreds of years, produced from this process which you see here by and separated by the process of distillation. Methanol, CH3OH, is an example of a, an alcohol, an aliphatic alcohol. And this one here, propanone, is an example of a ketone, CH3, CO, CH3. So three different substances from three families of organic compounds. We call these families today homologous series. Now, I can 
hopefully what you'll also notice is this liquid which I have here is quite murky. It's quite murky. It's not a crystal clear liquid like these here. And the reason is that there are actually two layers there with this liquid. Those two layers, one of them is an aqueous layer in which these three will be dissolved. So water is there as well. But the other one is a dense oily layer. Now that dense oily layer contains phenolic compounds, much larger molecules of an aromatic nature. They have benzene rings in the middle of them and then other branches coming off. So we have an oily residue and an aqueous residue. And this liquid is called a pyroligneous liquid. It's been pyro means fire, ligneous means from wood. Now what I'm going to do just, I hope to be able to demonstrate for you, is just to pour off some of this, um, some, this is water by the way, with universal indicator in it, it's green, Hopefully it will turn red when I pour it in to show the presence of an acid. There it's going in. Well, it's certainly not green. And by gum, we have a splendid result here. So there it is, you see. That's proof to you beyond all doubt whatsoever that I have just produced that an acidic liquid is produced by the pyrolysis of the, uh, the wood. And that, of course, is... A, ethanoic acid, acetic acid as it used to be known, and it smells of vinegar. If you don't mind, I'm just going to have a sniff of this to see what it smells like. It, it's quite unpleasant, I have to tell you, and it doesn't smell like vinegar at all. Obviously, all the other products mixed together, uh, but I, I do like smelling substances. You must excuse me, that's why I like chemistry so much. So, we have so far demonstrated then there are two types of product that we've spoken about. One is the gaseous product, which is a mixture of gases which involve carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen and hydrocarbons. And we've demonstrated carbon monoxide burning only and we have shown that the product form in the liquid state contains an acid without any doubt and I've told you that ethanoic acid, methanol and propanol are three different organic compounds produced which are members of three different families of compounds and that all of this was discovered, this type of knowledge was assumed in the middle of the 19th century by the German organic chemist of whom Friedrich Wohler was one and Justus von Liebig famous for his Liebig condenser, was another. And now what about the solid product? What's inside? What's left in this flask? It won't take any great imagination for you to know that this is, of course, charcoal. Charcoal is left behind. Charcoal has been made for thousands of years by conducting this process, and charcoal has had thousands of applications throughout the history of the human race. But I just wanted to focus on one specific application, and that is its use in the manufacture of gunpowder. As you, I'm sure, will know, gunpowder was first invented by the Chinese about a thousand years ago, and the one of the key ingredients that burnt in gunpowder was charcoal. And in this flask here, I have a, um, a, some powdered charcoal. Crazy, could I ask you please, in my box over there, excuse me, you may be able, oh, the box there, you should find a large lump of charcoal. Can you see one? Thank you so much, dear sir. Sorry, I forgot to, but I just wanted to show you. Look, everyone knows, thank you very much. This is a bit of barbecue charcoal, but that's how a large lump looks. And you know, if I put it in a flame, obviously it's not going to catch fire immediately. We have to heat it for a while. But this is about 90% carbon. And this charcoal, all wood charcoal, is about 90% carbon. It is very porous. You can actually see the structure of the grain of the wood from which this came. And that, of course, is 90% carbon and some inorganic substances and some fairly complex organic molecules as well. But, returning to the subject of gunpowder, charcoal has been known for thousands of years and the other ingredient in gunpowder is sulphur. Sulphur is an element found in underground, in volcanic regions. It's always been associated with fire and sulphur burns to make sulphur dioxide Charcoal burns to make 
carbon dioxide. But if you burn them in air, it's not much fun. You'll just get some sparks coming up from the charcoal. The sulfur will catch fire and burn with a very quiet blue flame, giving off phenomenally noxious fumes of sulfur dioxide. And that will be about it. Now, the genius of the Chinese is that they discovered the third ingredient. And I'm going to ask Dr. Owusu to hold this up closer to you. I have a few crystals of this third ingredient for you here. And I've got some in this flask is here finely powdered. And if you can have a look at those crystals, they are beautiful crystals of a substance which has played a great role in human history, not only through its use in gunpowder, but also in fertilizers and for helping us to understand the composition of air as a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. Before I tell you what that substance is, and I very much hope that most of you know in any case, I wanted to tell you that the reason why the Chinese discovered it, because it literally grew out of the soil. Thank you very much, Kwesi. So if we put this down, and as it grew out of the soil, how on earth can crystals grow out of the soil? It's a long process, essentially where cattle pass urine, and the urine reacts reacted with residues in the soil, which I'll be showing you very shortly, then potassium nitrate was produced in nature. And you might also know that potassium nitrate, on account of it, its extreme importance, has played a major role in the explosives industry. And it was manufactured mainly in India. India was the country which used to export huge amounts of potassium nitrate throughout the world for the manufacture of gunpowder and for use in artificial fertilizers. And so, potassium nitrate then was this key ingredient. How did it make the gunpowder work? What was the, what was the magic thing about gunpowder? The honest truth is the Chinese didn't know. But then they didn't care. They knew that it gave a good result. And much of science has developed empirically simply through people using common sense and being able to note and remember what happened and then be able to exploit it for their benefit. So I'm just going to show you, explain to you a little bit about gunpowder and how it has played or how it has been made. Now, the one thing I'm sure you'll recognize is that gunpowder wasn't invented overnight. Gunpowder would have taken hundreds of years for people to recognize the fact that where people were burning fires, in the vicinity of campfires or wood fires, these crystals seem to be found in the soil. I note once again, we're talking of hot countries with a wet, moist climate and cattle urinating. So you have to have all those three, farmyard soils and so forth. And those crystals were there. And what the Chinese would have observed is that in the vicinity of those crystals, the charcoal would have sparked up or burnt a little bit better. And over the hundreds of years that elapsed, they would have started adding these crystals, powdering them up, and getting a result which has led to gunpowder. So I just wanted to show you now how this type of powder burns. And I'm going to pour at this. And I wanted also to tell you that gunpowder is made from proportions which are approximately, once again you should know this, 75% potassium nitrate, 15% charcoal, 10% sulfur by mass. And that result, those proportions, were achieved over a period of hundreds of years. We still can't write an equation for the combustion of gunpowder. It's so complicated. But once we take those three elements, those three, rather, two elements and one compound. This is a non-metal element, a non-metal element, and the compound potassium nitrate, formula KNO3, as I'm sure you know. Then we mix them together, then we will get something like this. And the Chinese, they used to call this serpentine powder. So I'm pouring out a trail of this powder now, mixed in the right proportions of 75% by mass, 75% by mass of potassium nitrate, 
15% by mass of charcoal and 10% by mass of sulfur. There we are. It's all oh, there we are. I'm just going to spread it out a little bit more with a spatula and then I'm going to set fire to it. And I'm going to ask you, do you think that this is the way that gunpowder burns or is this what you'd expect when you mix these up? Because people frequently mix these together and try and get a result and they're surprisingly disappointed. Now, I'm going to ask Dr. Owusu to kindly put the fume cupboard on. As you can imagine, this is going to make a lot of smoke. Uh, let's actually, let's, let's let it happen first. And please, let's, before we switch it on, let's light it first. So, this is what's known as coarse serpentine powder. It has not particularly been mixed to um, uh, the ground to a great deal. And you see, it's not even that easy to ignite. But once it's burnt, then I'll ask uh, Dr. Owusu to kindly turn on the fume cupboard. So here it is. I'm just mixing it up. And there you see. Now, I'm sure you'll agree that's not exactly spectacular. It's quite good fun. It's giving it a lot of light and a lot of sparks, but that's not exactly something that you could say will make a banger go off or something along those lines. And what I wanted to show you now is to look at the residue. If you look at the residue which is left behind, you will notice that there are many yellow blotches on there, pale yellow blotches. And those pale yellow blotches are the remnants of unreacted or partially reacted potassium nitrate. Because when potassium nitrate only partially oxidizes the mixture, it becomes potassium nitrite. Indeed, if you heat potassium nitrate on its own, it gives off oxygen and potassium nitrite. 2KNO3 gives you 2KNO2 plus O2. So that's what the residue is there. However, the Chinese recognized that if you grind up the powder, if you grind it up for 12 hours in using heavy stones, and we call the process is called milling, then you get a much finer powder which burns much more efficiently. So I'm now going to set fire to some of this much more efficiently ground powder which contains a much higher surface area and let's see how this burns. So we've now put some milled serpentine powder once again using common sense it's the same technology as is used for bread making by the way flour has been made since time immemorial by grinding the 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 wheat seeds etc and this is the same way that we grind the powder to increase the surface area it's intuitive you don't necessarily have to understand the sides so watch how this will burn much more smoothly i now place my um, my splint there and with a little bit there, and you notice here, it's quite a bit smoother, the reaction. As I said, that is the coarse powder, which has been milled for 12 hours. And notice this time, you'll notice almost the absence of the yellow blotches. They're much, much smaller, and the reason is that the combustion was much more efficient. Now, the next stage that the Chinese invented, they again baking technologies they said well why don't we to this milled powder why don't we add some water or some alcohol etc and perhaps that will give us a result which will be even better still and they did they made a dough out of it like a baker's dough for making bread they pushed it through a sieve some sort of um, metal mesh or whatever and then they dried it and then they made a completely different product or yet another type of product which today we call black powder now I'm going to pour this I'm going to pour some of this on here you see and I'm going to set fire to it and you'll notice the granules are quite coarse the granules are coarse, but in every granule there is a very intimate mixture of charcoal, of um, sulphur and of um, potassium nitrate. Now, this will burn quite a bit more dramatically, obviously, so I'm going to just excuse me while I put on some safety goggles and also a gauntlet. So I'm just going to kit myself up to make sure that I'm acting uh, sensibly. So. Here we are, Just, I'm going to light it with my left hand and I'm going to put on a pair of goggles. The reason being, 
obviously a spark could go into my eyes or face or something like that. So, here's our wooden splint, as I said earlier. We're burning not the wood, but we're burning, because when the splint burns, the heat from the flame decomposes the wood. So, watch carefully now as we burn some um, milled and um, black powder, essentially. And there you see a beautiful combustion, immediately a wonderful cloud of smoke, of course, and allow me to blow out my splint. And this time, if you look carefully, you will see that the residue is much more finely dispersed. It's gone further away. Well, because the combustion was much more rapid. So it threw out the residue and it's lying on the sides. And now, of course, when the Chinese discovered that, we humans, we all get terribly excited with this type of burning. Say, great, what can we do with it? There is a certain amount of fun involved, which clearly Dr. Ousu and I are having. He's beaming with laughter and so am I, because this is great fun doing this. So they said, what else could we do with it? They invented fireworks, obviously, pyrotechnics. And I just wanted to show you here, I have made my own little um, pyrotechnic device. I haven't made it in front of you because I just thought it would save time. And I have a small pyrotechnic device here, which we in today's uh, world we call a banger. In the olden days it was called a firecracker. And that's the way you can, you can describe it. This is essentially a firecracker. Now, it's been made from two sheets of A4 paper stuck together, rolled up into a roll, and then glued together with this, which is here, which is uh, tape, basically just sticky tape, uh, with several layers of it. Then I poured in seven spatula measures of the black powder which I had made there. I put a fuse on it, and I'm going to show you the remarkable effect that this achieves when it burns. At least, I hope this will be a remarkable effect. And what I wanted to tell you furthermore is that um, the Chinese, when they did this, they obviously didn't have A4 paper and sticky tape. I'm sure you can guess what they used. They used bamboo. Bamboo, you see, is a natural growing, it's a natural growing bush or tree, and inside the stems are hollow. And, and it's also, it's segmented, so you get segments. So that was particularly useful for making early firecrackers and early fireworks. So I'm now going to set this off in front of you, once again, um, taking care. So I'm going to put on my safety goggles, and I'll explain to you exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a flame from my candle, which I have here, and I'm going to, this is, by the way, what I call a banger cage. It's a steel tube, and I have welded onto the end of the tube two, sh two bits of perforated steel like that, and inside there is a shelf. There is a shelf on which I shall place my pyrotechnic device. So there's my pyrotechnic device like that, you see. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take a splint, I'm going to take a wooden splint, I'm going to light the fuse there, and as soon as I've lit the fuse, I shall then put the end over it like this, I shall hold it high in the air, and we shall watch the combustion, watch the pyrotechnic device. So, watch carefully, and we shall hopefully keep our fingers crossed. Notice I've got spectacles on, but no gauntlets, because it actually doesn't get hot, and there's no risk to the hand. So, watch carefully. There it goes. And we now put the... And we now hold it. So, listen carefully and hopefully you'll hear a loud bang. Spark! And there it is. Dr. Ousu has just fallen over. Are you okay, sir? Yes, he says he's fine. Thumbs up. Thank you very much. So, there you see, we have here, we have here a demonstration of the use of empirical knowledge de developed initially by the Chinese and you see our banger has been shattered and erupted and there, is, uh, and there it is, you see, a pyrotechnic device, great entertainment for all. Having then demonstrated for you, having shown you the effects of the pyrolysis or the thermal decomposition of wood, the breakdown of wood, which I'll repeat, a mixture of gases, a mixture of liquids and charcoal, which plays a key role in gunpowder. Let's now turn to the products of what actually 
is formed when the wood burns. So here we've now, I've told you that in between the wood which you see here and the final product which is coming off from this flame, there is the intermediate stage with all these things I've been talking about. But when the wood burns, what, is, what are the two main products? Well, wood, as I said, is a natural carbohydrate. It's a natural polymer, a carbohydrate called cellulose. So it stands to reason that when this burns, it combines with oxygen in the air to make primarily two products, carbon dioxide and water. So those are the two products. We can say that carbon dioxide is the airy form product, the one that becomes a gas. Water, when condensed as steam, will form a liquid. And there is a solid product left, right at the very end. What you see, the black stuff, by the way, that's unburnt carbon, but if you allow wood to completely combust, you end up with a light grey powder. Those of you who have burnt campfires will know that, and the light grey powder is simply called ash, wood ash. So I'm just going to spend the last few minutes telling you a little bit about what actually is inside wood ash, because that too is very interesting. Well, the first thing I wanted to tell you is that wood ash contains compounds of two metals, calcium and potassium, and also silicon and other elements in tiny, tiny amounts. Now, the calcium and potassium are in the form of calcium oxide and potassium carbonate. Now, calcium, of course, is an alkaline earth metal, so calcium oxide is slightly alkaline in water, and potassium carbonate is a salt which is also slightly alkaline in water for the reason it is derived from the strong alkali potassium hydroxide and the very weak acid carbonic acid and therefore it gives a salt potassium carbonate which is slightly alkaline if you don't mind i'm just going to remove these crazy could you kindly take these away to one side Thank you very much indeed, that's much appreciated. And so what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to take just to show you that this is actually alkaline. And the way we do it is to take a small quantity of wood ash, which I have taken from some campfires which I burnt some wood, and put them into a piece of filter paper. And I'm going to put them into a piece of filter paper. And what's the obvious thing to do to prove that it's alkaline? Crazy, thank you very much. And Dr. Owusu will now prepare the next experiment while I just get this one going for you. And I'm going to, I have in here, in this flask here, I have water to which I have added a small quantity of universal indicator, which is neutral. However, when I pour this water through my wood ash in the filter paper, the wood ash will stay behind because it's a solid, but hopefully, the colour of the water will change dramatically. It's coming through, fingers crossed that we get a result to show that there is an alkali present. Now, of course, calcium is a member of the group of elements called the alkaline earth metals. They are not particularly soluble in water, and calcium oxide is the one of the ingredients there and potassium carbonate as i said earlier is an alkali metal and as i pour the water through sure enough to my utter delight i am very pleased to report to you that it is coming through as a, with a, a violet color and that is due to the presence of two hydroxides calcium hydroxide which is barely soluble in water and potassium hydroxide formed from the hydrolysis of potassium carbonate. And at this stage, I'm going to ask Dr. Owusu to demonstrate to you, close to the camera, the fact that the wood ash contains a carbonate. Now, I'm sure you know what the test for a carbonate is. Any carbonate, which when it reacts with a dilute acid, will produce carbon dioxide. It will start fizzing, and it will produce carbon dioxide, and the test for that is it turns lime water milky. 
Now, on my left, Dr. Owusu has just added some dilute sulfuric acid to some wood ash, and it's frothing up like the clappers, as I hope you can see, and he will just swirl it around a bit more to make sure, and you will shortly see the lime water turning milky. Now, what that is doing, that is demonstrating for you that without any doubt, the fact that it fizzes means it's a carbonate, and the fact that the lime water is going milky tells you that the gas coming off is carbon dioxide. So, uh, that might be out of focus. Like we, 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 unfortunately, we don't have a cameraman here, so we've experimented a bit, but I hope you can see it going milky. Thank you very, very much indeed, sir. So, that that you see is irrefutable evidence that there is a carbonate present in wood ash, and I'm telling you that that carbonate is potassium carbonate. Now, before we go on to our final experiment, I wanted to show you, I told you the other main metal is calcium, and calcium can be extracted, both of these metals can be extracted, indeed from wood, by the process of electrolysis. It was the great English chemist, Humphrey Davy, who developed the technique of electrolysis as a means of decomposing compounds into their elements. So I'm now going to take some calcium for you, some metallic calcium, and show you its reaction with water. Excuse me. This is a trough which contains water. Now what I'm going to do, I have here, I have some granules of calcium metal, and I'm going to pour the calcium, by the way, let's just pour, this is so beautiful, these colours are so wonderful, you see. There it is, you see. So that's showing you the alkalinity of wood ash. And I am now going to sprinkle some calcium into this. And when calcium reacts with water, it makes calcium hydroxide, which is barely soluble in water, and hydrogen gas. And what I will do, I will set fire to the hydrogen gas as it is on the water, and you can then see it burning. So... I'm now just going to take um, a wooden splint here. I shall sprinkle some calcium. These are calcium granules here. They're beautiful and shiny, by the way, like all metals. And once this is bubbling, I will apply a lighted splint, and you can see the hydrogen burning with a beautiful brick-red flame. So let's go. Here we go. So there's a bit of calcium going in, a, which we call a generous sprinkling. And there it is. It's now beginning to bubble. Boil and bubble and toil and trouble. And now let's light the hydrogen. And there you see hydrogen, you see. There is burning. Notice the color of the flame. It is a brick red flame. And the reason why it's a brick red flame is because that is the, com that is the color of calcium, the calcium flame. And notice that in the meantime, the water has gone very, very milky. It's become very milky, and that, of course, is due to the formation of a significant amount of calcium hydroxide. So that, then, is another demonstration of showing you what the elements present in wood can get up to. Now, I've demonstrated then, I've told you a little bit about the composition of wood ash, which is the product, the solid product left from the combustion of wood. Incidentally, wood ash weighs approximately 1% of the total mass of the wood. So that's all that's left. But it is the most critical substance indeed. And it is indeed from wood ash, the potassium carbonate part of it, that gave rise to potassium nitrate crystals through bacterial and atmospheric oxidation with nitrogen involved that was exploited by the Chinese for making gunpowder. Now, what I'm going to do is to turn to the final experiment which I have, and that's, of course, we're now returning back to the pyrolysis of the, um, the um, wood. And the gas, which I have not yet combusted for you, which is the third most co commonly produced, and that is hydrogen. So I have hydrogen, of course, is the lightest gas in the universe. And so, here is a balloon uh, filled with hydrogen gas, 
and I'm going to set fire to this balloon. Let me just lower it a tiny bit. Before I set fire to it, I have to take safety precautions. It makes a beautiful orange flame, as I'm sure you will see. But the important thing is that I don't have any flammables. These are very flammable liquids. So I have to make sure that these flammables are well away because we wouldn't want the flame to accidentally touch upon something which could catch fire. So I'm going to use for this purpose, I'm going to use a um, um, splint like this and this is pure hydrogen burning. One of the products of the pyrolysis of, of wood which is going to be burning and I'll ask you to watch carefully and then after that we have one more balloon to burn. So please watch carefully now. This is pure hydrogen burning in air. And there it is, a very straightforward reaction, nothing too wild. When hydrogen burns in air, of course, it makes water. The chemical reaction is 2H2 plus O2 makes 2H2O. In this balloon which I have here, I have a stoichiometric mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. Now, stoichiometric means I've mixed them in the ratio of exactly 2 to 1, as far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, it's approximate. But this, when this burns, it makes an exceedingly loud bang. It makes an exceedingly loud bang to such an extent that Pilatre de Rosi, the French engineer, he used to call it aria tonante, which means thunder air. And once I have done this experiment, which will make a very loud bang, now you probably won't hear the, uh, the bang that loud, but watch, it's a flash. It's a very, very bright flash indeed. And after that, I will say goodbye to you and thank you for your attention. So please watch carefully, watch carefully and listen carefully. And this is then thunder air, a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. So there it is. Please come over, Dr. Awusu. Thank you very much. That is the last experiment. I hope you've enjoyed learning something about the combustion of wood. Thank you very much indeed, dear sir, for your kind assistance. And thank you everyone for watching. And very, very best wishes to you all. Thank you.